let me start. I do welcome you here. Thank you for coming. I do welcome, of course, uh, Professor Eitan Gilboa. Uh, and uh, this is another series of our lectures uh, uh, and discussions about uh, defense, security, foreign affairs, and related to the Middle East, but not only to the, East, to the Middle East, but we will talk also about uh, uh, United States of America, American policies, uh, what is known, what is unknown, what we can predict, what we can uh, try to find out, uh, uh, what is Trump's, what are Trump's positions, uh, what is President Trump going to be doing uh, and uh, what we can expect from him, specifically related to Middle East, uh, but maybe uh, looking into the Middle East we can, uh, we can discuss some other issues uh, and some other lessons which we can learn from, his, uh, from the first steps of his administration, from the people he has encircled himself with and uh, who have already conducted some uh, Middle Eastern policies. Uh, uh, so far we, of course, don't know what is going to be the result, what is going to be the end game, what is going to be rhythm, and uh, how that will be uh, proceeding. Uh, before I introduce Professor Gilboa, I uh, would like to thank uh, the Czech-Israeli Chamber of Commerce for supporting this event. Uh, of course, the Israeli Public Diplomacy Forum, because that's the institution which has brought Professor Gilboa to Prague, to Brno and Prague, and actually, actually to Bratislava, Brno and Prague, uh, in the last few days for very many le lectures uh, dealing with very many topics, uh, uh, and not only and exclusively about Israel, but about broader issues. Uh, and one of them we will be discussing here uh, today. Uh, of course, I do thank Yagelo 2000, uh, uh, the organization which has been co-hosting Professor Gilboa on, on several of the events uh, and which works closely uh, with uh, the Severo Institute and which deals with the security issues, defense issues, uh, NATO, transatlantic relations, uh, Euro-Atlantic relations, uh, at, uh, etc. And of course, this event is organized by the Prague Center for Transatlantic Relations, uh, which is a affiliated directly with our institute, with our college. Uh, Professor Gilboa uh, is a prolific writer and commentator. Uh, he's been educated at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and at the Harvard University in the United States of America. Uh, he is uh, founding director of the School of Communication at Bar Ilan University, a uh, uh, conservative university in the Tel Aviv area. Uh, uh, to uh, introduce it more, he's a director of the Center for International Communications and senior research associate at the BESA Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, we did have some people linked and affiliated with uh, BESA, which means Begin Sadat Center of the Bar Ilan University in the past at our institute as well. And uh, he is also a visiting professor of public, public diplomacy at the University of Southern California. Uh, before I give him the floor, uh, I would like to remind you that, of course, afterwards there will be chance to uh, ask questions. I hope that we will have lively debate. Uh, I just remind uh, everyone that uh, to be to have sharp questions uh, or very sharp uh, and very uh, uh, very short comments. Uh, uh, that the floor will be also for the others, and that professor will be able to uh, to uh, react. Uh, uh, please don't give your long opinions and long lectures. Uh, for the lecture and for the answers, uh, uh, Professor Gilboa has come from Israel to uh, speak to us and to uh, talk with us. So without, without uh, further ado, uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Professor will speak for about 35, 40 minutes and then, of course, there will be the floor for the discussion with you. Thank you for coming. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tomas, for this introduction. You have challenged me a lot because this is the third time that we are together on a similar subject. He was yesterday a commentator, today a moderator of an event that we did a few hours ago, and this is the third time, and I have keeping changing my subjects to fit with, uh, with you. Uh, I would like also to thank the Serbo Institute for hosting us and, for, and to the organizers of this, uh, of this event. 
So I'll begin uh, with a, a brief introduction about the main issues. This is our topic, uh, Trump uh, and the Middle East. And I will begin with a, a little historical introduction because without, without it, it's extremely difficult to understand what has happened in recent years and what is likely to develop in the next few years. Uh, at least uh, um, Trump is likely to stay at the White House uh, at least four years if he's not getting, if he's not, if he's not going to get tired or impeached. Um, so this is the Middle East. Uh, you may be surprised to hear that there is a debate about the issue, where is the Middle East? Obviously, the Middle East, as uh, many other terms used in connection with the Middle East, did, did not come from the area itself, but from the outside. Because uh, where is the middle? The middle between what and what? And this is, uh, this is a British term coined uh, during the years of the British Empire. So from Britain, this is the Middle East, Japan and Korea are the Far East. And there are also some uh, definitions of the Middle East. Uh, so this, this particular one uh, goes from Afghanistan all the way to Morocco and from Turkey here to, to Sudan. It is based on religion, sometimes on, on, on language, on culture. But there's also uh, an arrow, an arrow where uh, definition of the region. So. This is the one that we mostly will be speaking about this evening. And so this is, this is Israel here. The immediate neighbors of Israel are here. So this is from Iran, major powers of Iran, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. So this is, this is the Middle East that we are talking about. This is Israel, just to introduce you uh, to Israel. So this is uh, Israel. About 8 million people, 8,000 uh, miles. That's a very small country. This is the West Bank and this is Gaza. West Bank uh, is uh, uh, controlled jointly by the Palestinian Authority and Israel. Gaza is controlled by Hamas, uh, a radical Islamic uh, group. And, um, and um, uh, Israel's neighbors are Egypt and Jordan, with whom Israel has peace agreements. Uh, we have an agreement with the Palestinian Authority. This is Syria, Lebanon, uh, Golan Heights were taken from Syria back in 1967 war and still uh, Israel uh, holds it. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, 8 million people and eight, uh, eight, about 8,000 uh, uh, kilometers. We need to speak first about, uh, so this is, this is the Trump administration. Uh, we know all about Trump. I don't know much he knows about himself, but we know about him. And these are his main advisors on, uh, on uh, national security matters. Uh, this is the uh, foreign minister, a businessman with experience in uh, Middle Eastern negotiations over gas and oil. He's supposed to also uh, be a friend of Putin and has no background whatsoever in politics and diplomacy. Maybe sometimes this is an advantage. This is James Matisse, a general. Uh, with a lot of experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. He is the Secretary of Defense. He's the first general uh, to serve as Secretary of Defense. This is John Kelly, Secretary, also General, so three generals here, General, uh, who is responsible for Homeland Security. This is uh, McMaster, who is now the new National Security Advisor, also a general, who is known for his uh, style of challenging uh, superiors. And, his promotion was held up because of that uh, for, for some time. These are other advisors whom uh, are less known, but are very close to, uh, to the president. Uh, this is Steve Bannum, who is credited with uh, Trump's victory in the elections, and who is behind uh, 
Trump's attacks on, on the media. Uh, the, uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, Jason, uh, this is Kushner, Gerald Kushner, who is a son-in-law of Trump and is responsible now for uh, introducing business culture to the American government. Uh, this is Jason Greenblatt, a long-time associate of Trump, who has been assigned the role of negotiator for all American dealings, deals in the world. So these, uh, these three people here are at the White House, very close to the President, and probably have a lot of influence about his policy-making and decision-making processes. So here I want to simply present a list of challenges that Trump uh, is facing, especially in the Middle East. And I wrote Obama's legacy because, unfortunately, Trump has to do a lot of repairing and correcting uh, some of the uh, issues that were poorly handled by Obama and are now for him to correct. So I'll go one by one. Uh, the first uh, challenge is to restore American uh, leadership and, and, and credibility because during the Obama years at the White House, uh, the perception has been that the United States was no longer interested in what is happening in the Middle East. It is withdrawing from the area. One explanation uh, which was suggested is that uh, the United States no longer depends on oil and gas from the Middle East, so, so it has less interest. I do not subscribe to that uh, uh, theory because I think that the United States did not enter the Middle East after the, the Second World War just because of oil and gas. And so I don't believe that uh, Obama uh, was leaving the Middle East because of, because of oil and, uh, and gas. There were other uh, forces, uh, other factors uh, in his decision. In any way, uh, most of American Arab allies and Israel and other countries and enemies of the United States perceived Obama to lose uh, American leadership and credibility in the region. So Trump has, if he's interested, to restore that um, leadership. Second is contain Iran uh, nuclear uh, and regional ambitions which are connected. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal left many issues unresolved. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, but uh, for Obama, Iran looked like uh, a state to collaborate with. Uh, for Trump, Iran uh, will become again an enemy, maybe a dangerous enemy that has uh, to be contained. And so the major, major difference between Obama and, uh, and Trump. Third, stop the war in Syria, which has already claimed 500,000 uh, casualties and, um, and uh, complete destruction of the major cities and infrastructure. How to stop this war? Next, how to limit the Russian direct military intervention, which is, has increased uh, the prestige uh, and, and uh, a perception of Putin as a, as a much more reliable and determined leader. So the idea is how to, how to limit uh, the influence of Russia in Syria. Next, how to destroy the Islamic State. Here both Obama and Trump and many others, almost everybody, uh, wants uh, uh, ISIS to be eliminated and the major debate was only on the means to achieve this goal, but I'll come back to that a little bit later. What to do with Turkey? Turkey is a member of NATO. Erdogan uh, is trying to be the new Sultan and has been moving Turkey more and more into an Islamic theocracy. Uh, the United States uh, has ambivalent uh, attitudes toward Erdogan, and Erdogan himself does not make it easier 
because of his aggressive policies in Syria versus the Turk, uh, the Kurds and others. And finally, how to repair relations with the American Arab allies and, and Israel. So I want now to go into, oh, and avoid another failure uh, in uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Uh, at first, everybody thought that he would not be interested in this area. It turns out not to be the case, but then I'll come back to that a little bit later. So this is a long list of problems that Obama left to Trump, uh, which became challenges that he has uh, to work on them and prepare effective ways uh, to solve them or to um, promote American interests while solving them. I want to talk a little bit about uh, history, religion, and culture. People in the West, especially in Western Europe, especially uh, in certain countries and in the United States, uh, fail to take into consideration three major elements, components of political motivation in the Middle East. One is um, history, second is religion, and third is culture. Without these three, it's very difficult to understand what is happening. So, in the last few years, what we have seen is the re-emergence of the historical religious confrontation between the two sections in Islam, the Sunni and the Shiite. And I want to show you here how it's being divided in the Middle East. So, the green are the Shiite predominantly states. So this is Iran, Iraq, and Lebanon here, you see. And the red countries are the Sunni countries. And there's a huge, a huge hostility, rivalry, competition based on history and religion between these two sections. But Shiites exist elsewhere in the Middle East. So this tells you about the ratio between Sunnis and Shiites in other parts of the Middle East. And this is very important uh, because of Iran's hegemonic aspirations in the area. So you can see, for example, Kuwait, 20 to 25 percent Shiites. Bahrain, 65 to 75 percent Shiites. Qatar, 10 percent. Yemen, 35 to 40 percent Shiites. And Syria, 50 to 20 percent. Iraq is 25 to 70 percent. Iran, 90 percent. But you see also here, Shiites here, 10 to 15 percent of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, similar ratio between uh, Sunnis and Shiites. And so what Iran is trying to do is to use the religious connection and affiliation between itself as a Shiite power and Shiites all over the place here to, to uh, uh, operate, to challenge existing governments. So Iran wants to dominate the entire Middle East, wants to lead the Muslim and the Arab world, and so Iran is the source of instability and violence in the entire region. And uh, today we have civil wars in Iraq and Syria, civil war in Yemen, and also a civil war in, uh, in Libya, which is not here. Very difficult, serious, tribal type of warfare among, among tribes, but also uh, there is a very serious religious component in those fighting. So this is necessary to remember when, it, when we deal with Western policies, especially American policy under the Trump administration. have a number of failed states in the region. A failed state means that it has a government, maybe a representative at the United Nations, but it is dysfunctional. Somebody else or, or several groups control that state and they fight each other. So I have a long list of those failed states. It's Lebanon, 
where Hezbollah is controlling the state. It has a government, it has a president, uh, but real, the real ruler of Lebanon is Hezbollah, in Arabic party of God, a Shiite uh, group, movement. Palestinian Authority is a failed government. Hamas in Gaza, the same thing. Iraq, failed government. Somalia, it's not a really a state, failed government. And Syria, Libya, and Yemen uh, are engulfed in uh, civil wars. A long list of failed states, failed governments. The problem is that when you do not have a functional government, you don't know whom to address. What is the address of the people responsible for running those states and, uh, and governments? This is uh, Syria. And it's very difficult to understand what's going, there, going on there because uh, too many uh, regional, internal, regional, and international forces are involved. Uh, they have their own agenda. Uh, they make things difficult to achieve both in, in war and in uh, peace processes. And you can see this is a friend. This is a foe, and this is uncertain, a number of uncertain, uh, uncertain places. Very difficult to understand what's happening, and even more difficult to resolve what is happening. This is another graphic depiction. Everybody is fighting everybody else. Uh, everybody says they want to, uh, to fight ISIS, but they fight other causes, such as Turkey. Turkey is interested. Turkey is not interested in Assad, not in ISIS. Turkey is only interested in preventing a Kurdish state. Why Kurdish state? Because they have a, a, a substantial Kurdish population and they think that if the Kurds are able to establish uh, a state of their own, northern Iraq, maybe northern Syria, all the Kurds in Turkey would like to establish their own separation from Turkey. So what they say and what they really mean is very different. But this is true for the entire Middle East. Uh, I always suggest to not to always believe what leaders are saying. This is Russia uh, in Syria. Uh, I need to say that the Obama administration assumed, first of all, for them it was a big surprise that Putin went to Syria. And I don't know why it was a surprise, because as I said earlier, Obama created the impression that he's not interested in what is happening in the region, and uh, he left a leadership vacuum. Leadership vacuums are filled quickly. And obviously Putin uh, noticed that. It was not difficult to, to see that. And exploited the opportunity to reassert um, Russian power and influence in the Middle East. Um, uh, I'm, I, I understand that Iran went to Russia and told Russia, if you do not intervene then Bashar al-Assad is going to disappear. Which tells me an interesting um, fact about, about Iran. Because this, this for me is a sign of Iranian weakness. I don't know if it's true or not, but Russia decided to intervene. Uh, Obama thought that uh, this intervention is going to be like the Russian failed intervention in Afghanistan, which lasted 10 years, or the American intervention in Vietnam. So why to bother? Let's put in, get himself into the mud, and this will even weaken more Russia, which is weak economically and, uh, and politically, uh, economically and, and militarily. So why bother? But it turns out that Russia uh, was interested in preserving Bashar Assad because he is the one of the stronger, uh, strongest allies of Russia. And secondly, this uh, was a golden opportunity uh, to show who is the real leader and who is not. So Putin uh, established himself as a, as a strong leader who knows exactly what he wants and is determined to achieve what he wants that he is loyal to his allies, unlike Obama, and, uh, and that this would give a signal 
to American Arab allies to leave the United States and come to him. And certain, uh, certain Arab countries were looking for some kind of a relationship with Putin. So the Russian presence in Syria is obviously is not temporary. It looks more as permanent. And uh, you can see here, these are, this is a, a naval base at Tartus that the Russians built uh, a few years ago. But now they are building another one in Latakia. And they have uh, Air Force bases right here. So all of these represent locations for Russian uh, presence, military installations inside Syria. And you can say uh, who they bombed. So this, this is ISIS here, shrinking a little bit. This is ISIS. So they were bombing rebel groups, which the United States supported and equipped, rebel groups against Bashar al-Assad. So when Putin said, I am attacking ISIS, he didn't do that. He attacked mostly uh, those targets. So the Russian intervention in Syria uh, and the projection of Russian power and influence into the region, in my judgment, presents a threat or a challenge to both Europe and the United States. Post-ISIS. Uh, I assume that ISIS will lose its territorial bases in both Iraq and Syria. It's just a matter of time. This is because everybody is against ISIS and the combination of forces on the ground and the air attacks from above uh, do the job. So ISIS will lose its territorial basis. What will happen after ISIS? We call it post-ISIS. I think uh, the American president as well as Europe have to think about it. What, what will emerge? So uh, issue number one is the future of Syria. What will happen in Syria? Is it, is it possible at all to maintain the territorial integrity of Syria? And this is also for, true for Iraq. Or these countries, which uh, have uh, a history of domestic and internal uh, hostility, can, can go back to the time before uh, the civil wars. Unlikely. But is it... Is it, is it is it uh, possible to create new political units in Syria and Iraq? So, future of Syria, future of Iraq. The ISIS idea is not going to disappear because uh, of the loss of territory, territorial basis. The ISIS idea, radical Islamic idea, which became so attractive to many Sunnis in Europe and in other Muslim countries, the uh, ISIS idea is to resurrect the greatness of Islam going back to uh, previous centuries. And the way to do it is by strict adherence to Islamic rules and Islamic laws. And if, if uh, you do that, then the Islamic Caliphate, which is like a world uh, Islamic kingdom, will be re-established. Now this is, this is a mission that attracts many young people, especially if they hate the West, then a caliphate would destroy the West. And it's, it's identity, many Muslims are looking for identity, who are who they are, especially young people are looking for identity. So the combination of identity and mission, these are not going to disappear. And they will emerge, re-emerge in other forms. And so ISIS exists also in other countries. I have a map here, and you can see where they are. They are in many, many places all over the region. If they lose the territorial bases in Iraq and Syria, they may resurface with ter a territorial or territorial bases in some of those uh, places, as you can see. They are in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, Libya, a lot here. 
Algeria, Nigeria, very strong in Nigeria. So all of those are still uh, intact and could re-emerge as significant uh, bases for Islamic uh, radical group, uh, groups. Now I want to speak uh, for a few minutes about the Iraq nuclear deal. It was a subject of a lot of controversy. Um, I, I, I need to say that uh, there were all kinds of misleading statements about the deal. For example, Obama said that only the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, opposed that deal. This is not true. All the American Arab allies opposed the deal. And when Israelis and Arabs say the same thing, one may better listen. Also, Obama said, it's either the deal or war. Not exactly. Because in the middle were sanctions. And Iran came to the table because of those sanctions. And if, uh, uh, if uh, Obama were to apply perhaps harsher sanctions, then we, perhaps he would have been able to negotiate a better deal. Also, Obama made a huge mistake with Iran by de facto removing the military option. Nobody, when he said the military option is on the table and repeated it many times, obviously it meant that he's not, he was not serious about it. So the Iranians felt secure. And then they were tough about, about the negotiations, about the details. And, and there were issues left out of the agreement which uh, um, shed a certain light on it. For example, all the missile testing was removed. And the United Nations Security Council resolution which approved of the deal also prohibited Iran from developing missiles. So every experiment in a missile Oh, Iran says the, the decision, the resolution prohibits missiles that can carry nuclear warheads. Oh, we have no intention of developing nuclear warheads. So, everybody with minimum understanding of missiles uh, would know that, you, that these missiles are developed only for carrying nuclear warheads. There is no other use for that. So, though there was a lot of missile testing was left out of the agreement. Also, Iran continues to support terrorism and violence in the entire region. This was also left out. Obama thought maybe the deal will moderate uh, the policies of Iran. Maybe the deal will increase the strength of the so-called uh, Rouhani people, President Rouhani of Iran, who is supposed to be more liberal and more moderate. But uh, we are now more than a year after the deal, and this did not happen. What happened is exactly the opposite. The, uh, the uh, moderates were losing influence because the people of Iran, many of them, uh, did not feel the fruits of the deal. And Rouhani told the people, oh, we need to deal this deal because of economic benefits. Funds will be unfrozen. We will now develop the economy. Well, funds were unfrozen but went to military uh, interventions and to terrorism and, to, uh, and to, to the military, basically. To the Republican guards who themselves have a huge economic empire. So this basic assumption of moderation in Iran did not work. These are the nuclear facilities in Iran. Many, many nuclear facilities. Yes, so far Iran adheres to the main articles of the agreement. Obama would have not cared if some of those uh, elements would have been violated. But I think Trump, who said that he would cancel the agreement, I don't think he's going to cancel the agreement, but he is going to be uh, monitoring every comma and, and every period in the agreement. He would be much more aggressive. For Obama, the cancellation of the deal by Iran would have been a major disaster and blow 
because he considers that agreement to be the uh, biggest achievement of his presidency. Trump says, I don't care if they cancel the deal, this is a bad deal anyway. And Trump is more aggressively, uh, will more aggressively deal with uh, missiles and Iranian military interventions in Yemen and in, um, in Syria and Iraq. And so while Obama was looking at Iran as a partner, uh, Trump and his aides are again looking at Iran as, as a, an enemy or at least as a, a, a rival force in the region. And this is, this is a, a major change in, in policies. This is the missile testing that occurred two days after Trump uh, uh, went uh, into the White House. And this was also a testing of Trump. Because Iran wanted to see what his response is going to be. And his response was very different from that of Obama. He immediately imposed new sanctions on the people and organizations in Tehran responsible for missiles and on those who are responsible for terrorism and violence. Like a list of names and organizations. And he told Iran that uh, in the language, in his language, I put you on notice. Which means I warn you. And to back up his words, he sent uh, naval forces near Yemen, near Aden. And the reason for that is simple. Uh, a few months ago, the civil war in Yemen is between Shiite Houthis and Sunnis. And the Houthis are uh, attacked by missiles an American destroyer. Obama didn't do a thing because he didn't want to alienate Iran. But Trump sent naval forces and said, he told Iran, not the Houthis, Iran, if the Houthis try me again and, and fire a missile, I will destroy them. I will use force against them. So this is creating some kind of a deterrence against Iran. We see here major shifts in policies compared to those adopted and implemented by Obama. But this is something that uh, is, uh, is related to Israel, but I think it's quite interesting uh, to note. So, uh, Javad Zarif was educated in the United States, speaks uh, English beautifully and perfectly. Uh, he's the nice face of, the, of Iran and Rouhani. He said on January 31st, uh, 2017, this is a Reuters, uh, a Reuters report, Iran will not use ballistic missiles to attack any country. Or we, use, we develop ballistic missiles only to defend ourselves. And then but he forgot that a few months earlier, Iran tested uh, ballistic missiles, and it, was, it is written here. Hmm. Battery went dead. But it, it's written here in Hebrew, Israel must be wiped out of the map. This is a particular missile. So, should we believe Iran? Should we believe what Rouhani says? Rouhani wrote a book how he was cheating and lying to the West about the Iran nuclear capabilities and nuclear power. No, this is not working now. So I will fix it. Uh, no, I, have my, I, I, no, I have my own. I have my own. We always have a, a, a replacement. Maybe it's a Iranian manipulation. Just a minute. No, no, I'm fine. I'll have to. Yeah? Yes, oh, perfect. Okay, the last, the last uh, section, for obvious reasons, that I want to speak about is uh, Trump and Israel. And I'll go by a few items on, on this issue. So, first of all, uh, the eight years of the Obama administration at the White House were 
marred by disagreements and tension uh, between uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu and him. There was also a personal element there. So the personal hostility added to the legitimate disagreements about Iran, Arab Spring, American attitudes towards the Arab Spring, uh, the situation in Syria, and Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. So there were serious disagreements, but there was also a difficult personal element there. Now this is going to change, and it has already to change, even dramatically. So the atmosphere at the White House is going to be different because uh, the personal relationship uh, is going to be the opposite of what happened during the Obama years. And there is much more agreement now than, uh, be between, much more agreement between uh, Trump and, and Netanyahu on critical issues of the Middle East. Iran, I mentioned, and Syria, I mentioned, and Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, I'll come to it in a minute. So the major issues. Um, Trump appointed uh, a close uh, colleague of his to be uh, the ambassador uh, to Israel. His name is David Friedman. There was a lot of opposition to him uh, because of all kinds of reasons. But I know that there are a number of ambassadors here and even a former prime minister and some others. And ambassadors usually don't have a policy of their own. And if they have, then they are fired. Ambassadors fulfill orders and instructions from, <clears throat> from the Prime Minister, from the Foreign Minister. And here, this particular ambassador was described as someone who has his own agenda and will do things on his own. This was from the beginning, was forfetched, unfounded, and he, is now, he has been confirmed by the Senate. The next issue is Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. The impression has been that Trump is not interested. And if I were him, I would not be that much interested. Because all American presidents since, I don't know, since 67 were doing the same thing and failed. So to say from the beginning that you want to achieve uh, a, a deal between Israel and the Palestinians uh, is somewhat, uh, somewhat exaggerated. Uh, but he surprised everybody, and he said he is interested in promoting Palestinian-Israeli negotiations. Contrary to what you read and hear uh, in Europe and maybe in other places, uh, the main obstacle to peace is not the Israeli position, but the Palestinian position. And how do I know that? For two or three reasons. One reason is that the Palestinians were offered a number of times um, generous proposals. Uh, the first was, um, a pro uh, was offered by the then Prime Minister Barak back in 2000. Then President Clinton improved it a little bit. Arafat rejected it. And Saudi leaders told him that he's crazy to refuse this uh, proposal. Then uh, in, two, in 2008, another Israeli Prime Minister offered uh, a major improved proposal to Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. And he said he would give an answer. And this, we, Israel is still waiting for his answer. And even in August, now 2000, August 2014, even under Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, John Kerry came up with another proposal which... Mahmoud Abbas again rejected. So there are all kinds of questions about the willingness or ability to make the, com the concessions needed really to achieve peace. Now, under Obama, they expected him, so to speak, to deliver Israel, which means to obtain from Israel concessions without them making reciprocal concessions. And we know that reciprocal concessions are needed to achieve an agreement. So, he applied a lot of pressure, Obama, on Netanyahu. 
to support the two states, uh, the two people's solution, to even free settlements. He, free, he froze settlements. Palestinian steel didn't come to the table. And since then, there were no negotiations because of Palestinian preconditions. And when the Palestinians felt that Obama does not do what they expected him to do, they decided to get those concessions via international hostile organizations such as the UN or UNESCO, where they, where they obtained an absurd resolution stating that there's no connection between the Jewish people and, and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It was funny for me also to see that uh, member, uh, European members of, the United, of UNESCO, such as France, Italy, they abstain. And this is interesting because if there is no Jewish connection to the Temple Mount, there is no Christianity. So how come Christian countries really do that kind of voting? This I don't understand. But this is what they are doing. And they went to the so-called Paris Middle East Peace Conference. If you want another term, which is uh, uh, absurd on its face, it's Middle East Peace Process. What does it mean? And it was created in Europe. What does it mean? That the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the source of all violence and all instability in the region. And only if uh, this conflict is resolved, suddenly uh, the Middle East will become the Garden of Eden. This has never been true, and in the last five years, it has even been proven to, to be even less true. What, what the civil wars in all, the, all of the Middle East, uh, the uh, so-called Arab Spring, the resurrections, the Iran's manipulation, what they have to do with Israeli-Palestinian relations? I'm, I'm giving you this introduction because Trump is trying to change that. So what he will suggest is this. He will um, try to move the Palestinians from international forums to direct negotiations backed by uh, American Arab allies. So it's, it's from international to regional to bilateral. International, regional, bilateral. And it remains to be seen if he's going to be successful in this effort because he sent his uh, Green, Jason Greenblatt to talk to Palestinians and Israelis. This Jason Greenblatt uh, is already a, a good diplomat because um, after his meetings with Israelis, he said, very good constructive meeting. Then he went to Ramallah and he said, very good and constructive meeting. But I bet that uh, if you analyze the positions of the two sides, there is still a lot of disagreement between these two, between the two states. I'm running out of time, so I'll only talk about moving the embassy to Jerusalem. This is really an anomaly that goes back to the beginning of the state. Somehow, although West Jerusalem was never in dispute, and from 1948 to 1967, it was divided, but East Jerusalem was in Jordanian hands. Still, the United States and much of the world uh, did not recognize even West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. There's no, no such thing in, in diplomatic history. When a country declares its capital, it's, it is its capital. But somehow Jerusalem uh, was uh, an exception to the rule. The United States even recognized, uh, had, had an embassy in East Berlin during the separation of, of, of Germany. Didn't make sense at the time. And since 1995, there is a congressional resolution requiring the president to move the embassy. Every six months, a president writes to Congress saying, I'm sorry, I cannot implement that resolution because of national security reasons. The next time... Uh, such a waiver has to be made is in June. So Trump has until June to figure out what to do. And it's not clear. Uh, his uh, his uh, aides are saying this is under consideration. Uh, Trump uh, may use the Jerusalem embassy transfer as a card vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians 
as a shrewd businessman, he will tell them, I decided to move the embassy. Oh, you don't want me to move the embassy? What are you prepared to give in return? And I want you to resume negotiations with Israel without any preconditions. The preconditions you have suggested so many times, which you know from in advance that Israel cannot accept. Or, and this is another clever solution, business solution, uh, he will separate the ambassador from the embassy. The ambassador, David Friedman, has apartments in Jerusalem. He will live in Jerusalem. Uh, he will have dinners for guests in his home in Jerusalem. He may work at the Jeru at a U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. So the solution would be to separate between the building, which will remain in Tel Aviv, and the ambassador, which will work in Jerusalem. And so Trump will be able to argue <coughs> that he fulfilled his commitment. It is like eating the cake and still keep it um, in one, one piece. So, uh, the last point uh, that uh, has to do with Israel is connected to the entire Middle East. And um, one of the strengths of American power in the region was uh, the close relations between the United States and, and Israel on the one hand and with Egypt on the other hand. So Obama was very successful in compromising these relations. And therefore, with the change in the White House, uh, Trump will have an opportunity to repair relations with Egypt, repair relations with Egypt, and create uh, a new alliance with the pro-American and Western Arab countries and Israel, whose main goal would be to contain Iran and also to help in the defeating of, the Islam, of Islamic radicalism wherever it exists uh, in the Middle East. What are the chances uh, for all of those ideas to happen? Yet yeah, it's not yet clear, but obviously I think the Trump administration will make an effort to resume negotiations, but given the uh, present initial positions of the two sides, the chances to achieve a peace agreement in the next, in the next five years are not that good. And on this pessimistic note, which is always good to be pessimistic about the Middle East, I'm ending my lecture. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. I will have two first, first two questions, and then, of course, the floor is for you, to yours. There is a microphone here, but let me ask one thing. I, as I read the situation and the first Trump's first two months, then there has been nothing basically surprising in his foreign policy. There has been not that much happening and uh, no surprises. But one surprise to me was that he really... Uh, uh, put some em em emphasis on this so-called Middle East peace process. That he first said that Jared Kushner is the one to, uh, uh, to go to the region and to make a peace. Uh, then he didn't send him, but he sent uh, Jason Greenblatt, uh, who has been his long-term lawyer and also very close associate, as he was on the picture. And he was in the region talking to everyone, having all the constructive uh, discussions. But my question is, how do you explain that? Why has he sent him there? Why is he, as Trump, like going for this battle which is going to be most likely unsuccessful? Or is he just trying to please everyone and say, okay, I have sent my son-in-law and I have sent my most trusted ally and advisor and he has really tried but nothing, so what else I can do, so get, get, get rid of this issue? Is he trying to show a nice face to everyone that he's not like criticized, which is 
not the Trump way as I would understand it, uh, uh, or is there any other explanation why they have gone into uh, this? Let me answer that. So, first of all, I don't think that Trump is concerned about people thinking that he is nice. This is the last thing he's concerned about. Uh, secondly, and I think this is my own idea, my own explanation, because there are not good explanations for this, I think maybe since he thinks that he can do a lot of things that others could not do, he has a strong motivation to, sh to demonstrate, oh, successive presidents fail. Obama failed. I'm going to succeed. Or I'm trying, I'll be trying to succeed. So, but as I said, I think this perhaps was a mistake uh, to, to enter this process that way. Perhaps a lower profile. I happen to think that you can achieve breakthroughs in negotiations, in conflict negotiations, only through secret diplomacy. And I think the cases uh, we have in a number of places, uh, like uh, the Egyptian-Israeli peace process, was started by secret diplomacy. The, the uh, Balkan arrangement was achieved by uh, the final solution, the solution there, by uh, secret diplomacy. Uh, because of, because uh, the issue is uh, very complicated and sensitive, I am not in favor of making those strong uh, promises or statements. Uh, but we really, we really don't know. Well, the last deal with the Palestinians in the Oslo agreement, no matter how we judge if it has been working or not, it it good, no, but it was also a secret agreement. So anything that has been negotiated in the past uh, then was a secret, and uh, you either make agreements through war or through secret negotiations, and not through public diplomacy. Uh, and the second question goes into the broader picture, which uh, Trump has touched uh, in the past, uh, and it goes to the fact that uh, Obama liked, and Obama's policy was more, friendly to U.S. adversaries and uh, opponents and enemies and not friendly to U.S. Uh, friends and traditional friends in the region. Uh, the most frustrated was uh, Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or even the most frustrated was probably, uh, probably Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and then the least frustrated from those three was Israel. Of course, there was frustration on the Turkish side, but Erdogan is being frustrated from anyone uh, all the time. So there is no one to please Erdogan. So it's, let's, let's put him aside. Uh, but there is this, uh, it, it reappears that uh, again and again, that there is like the new situation in the Middle East, uh, uh, very close or closer ties of Israel and Egypt, of Israel and Saudi Arabia, of Israel and other, other Gulf countries, and that there is somehow this like Israeli uh, Sunni Arab uh, uh, Arab states uh, alliance. Uh, of course, the enemies unite, so the, the Iranian unification uh, push uh, to that uh, is there. Uh, but uh, is it really, is it real, or is it real in terms of achieving something significant in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, situation in the Middle East as such, and I'm not talking about the Palestinian-Israeli process, uh, but maybe also to that. Is it something which the U.S. administration will play seriously with? Uh, is, it, uh, is it Trump going to be pushing it this way for, uh, so, and it, can it succeed in a way, or is it uh, doomed to be failure because now it is temporary that the Iranian influence unifies those enemies, but at the end uh, there is no real substance for the longer term. So how that uh, new regional reshaping of alliances or uh, friendships, maybe it's too strong, so of uh, less animosities, uh, maybe a uh, more proper description. How that will be played, uh, and how that will be played in terms of also those guys you had on the first uh, picture, meaning specifically Tillerson, who knows how to negotiate not only with Putin, but with Saudis regarding oil. He has great experience, he's not a diplomat, but he has great experience in negotiating complicated deal with those countries. And of course, all three generals who have great experience of their service in the Middle East and fighting in the Middle East, and most of the time fighting uh, more on the side of those uh, traditional friends of US. How that picture is going to be, or what we can say about it now? Okay. So, uh, my first response would be that 
This is uh, the rule, and especially it is valid for Trump, that he wants to show that he can do better than Obama, and this is also true for other states and other problems in the region. And since Obama, in his thinking, destroyed uh, the alliance between the United States and those countries, he wants to repair it. And I agree with you that the selection of uh, Rex Tillerson has something to do with that. Secondly, I think that, and, um, and I could have shown this on the map, Iran is building the a Shiite, a Shiite crescent alliance. So it is, if you look at the map, you see Iran, Baghdad, Tehran, Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut. And then if Yemen is added, so you have, eight, uh, you have also Yemen at, uh, at the south. And this is the number one, number one concern for both the United States and American Arab allies. Because they dream, you know, they, they have nightmares. This is the nightmare of Iran really taking over the whole place. This is why they have strongly opposed nuclear Iran. Because they think that if Iran becomes nuclear, then it's going to, to replace them, dominate them, conquer them, you name it. So, I think that there's a combination here of changes uh, in the region itself, in threat perception and responses to that threat perception. Now, um, there have been problems between uh, the United States and, and, the play, and, and, and Saudi Arabia, for example. Because Saudi Arabia is radical Islam. The Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia are radical Islam. Uh, Saudi Arabia is responsible for building all those Islamic madrasas. Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Bin Laden, Saudi. He came from those madrasas. So it has been counterproductive. And so you can't... So, so from an American perspective... Saudi Arabia represents a radical Islamic country, no human rights, a very conservative type of kingdom, and you give them sophisticated weapons, and you don't know if there's going to be like a revolution there, and those sophisticated weapons will go to radical Islamic groups. So a lot of dilemmas are here, what to do? Uh, one of the when I when I asked uh, the Obama people why you don't send equipment to those relatively moderate uh, rebel groups that wanted to remove Bashar al-Assad at the first phase of the civil war, the answer was, oh, they are no good than anybody else, and we don't know what will happen to this equipment. Tomorrow, maybe it will find its way into radical groups. And I want to remind you that Daesh or the Islamic State has been capturing and using American weapons. You, 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 can, see it, you can see it everywhere. So this is, this is uh, the chances to achieve this kind of alliance uh, are not without difficulties. And I can see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, problems that perhaps Rex Tillerson will be able to solve. But it's... Uh, what, whatever will develop relations between Washington and the Persian Gulf, Sheikhdoms and Saudi Arabia, even Egypt. Egypt is, is not an easy story because the regime in Egypt is uh, in terms of, of uh, the military uh, regime there is worse than it was in, in, in the time of, of Mubarak. So maybe, maybe for Trump doesn't mean a thing. Maybe he will overcome that. But then you have other forces in the United States that might be concerned about it, uh, especially Congress. So what would be the Israeli uh, uh, dream about Trump doing? First of all, not uh, dictating uh, anything of the kind that Obama did. I think what, uh, what Israel expects is exactly what I've, uh, I've said. Uh, first of all, to define Iran as the number one threat to stability and peace in the region and to be much more aggressive about uh, the issues that we have mentioned. Missiles, terrorism, military intervention. So Iran is number one. 
And I think there's a good chance that to happen. Uh, the second thing is uh, Syria. And I did not have uh, enough time. Because Israel has two main problems in Syria. With Hezbollah and with Islamic groups near the Israeli-Syrian border. So, Obama did not care about the solution in Syria. He wanted Bashar Assad out. I think for Israel it's very important that the United States at least be part of the process determining what the solution for Syria is going to be. And you cannot be sure about the results, but obviously to counter... See, what, what will happen in Syria is this. If ISIS is removed, and if the other rebels are also destroyed, and I think this is, is likely to happen, Iran and Hezbollah will uh, interpret that to be a major victory for themselves. And they, we won. We won. We are going to dictate. With Russian participation, this is a very bad way of, 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 the, uh, of dealing with the future of Syria. So I think uh, what Israel expects is for the, for the Trump administration to be much more involved in determining the future of Syria. I did not, uh, didn't have time to talk about the potential uh, deal between Trump and Putin, global deal. We did it in the last session we, we, here uh, a few hours ago. But Israel might be concerned about a deal with Putin which would strengthen Iran, would strengthen the position of Iran in the Middle East. So this is something that, um, that is perhaps something that, that should be of concern. And Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, I think, here the expectation is to avoid the kind of unilateral pressure, one-sided pressure. Uh, Israel also expects the United States uh, to fight uh, uh, anti-Israeli one-sided resolutions at the United Nations and in international organizations. Nikki Haley, the new U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, has been doing it already. So I think this is, this is uh, the United Nations is no longer would be able to have a free hand and accept any whims of uh, the Muslim uh, representation at the UN, 52 countries or so. So these are some of the expectations and I assume that uh, they came up in the first meeting between uh, Netanyahu and, and Trump a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, and in uh, discussions with his representative here, I think the new ambassador is going to come. So I am sure that these issues are going to be on the table, and uh, I expect uh, that many of them are going to be dealt favorably by the Trump administration. Thank you. So, please. Short questions. Please introduce yourself, Mr. Vanchura. Peter Vanchura, the Bell Institute for how do we call ourselves freedom and democracy. Um, the way I read reports, it seems that Trump told Putin in their phone call uh, to withdraw from Crimea. And it seems that he told Netanyahu in that conversation at the White House, uh, while very supportive of uh, Israel, to back off from, uh, from uh, expanding the settlements, which you skipped in your presentation. <clears throat> Don't you think that Trump wants to show his uh, partners in these discussions, please uh, behave with common sense? the beholder. Now, um, I think that first Trump said that settlements uh, is not an issue. And, uh, Obama was obsessive about settlements. Uh, he said they were illegal and also that uh, they prevent, prevent uh, negotiations uh, and that um, and that um, uh, this is the precondition of the Palestinians, but as I've said earlier, 
there was a freezing of settlements for almost a year, and still the Palestinians didn't come to the table. I then conclude that this is not the main obstacle, as is being described in the West. It's not the main obstacle. First, there is a historical record. Israel dismantled settlements and withdrew from all of Sinai in return for a genuine peace agreement with Egypt. And then Israel dismantled settlements and got out of Gaza. The expectation was that uh, the Palestinians would use the opportunity to demonstrate how they can live in peace with Israel. What was the result? A Hamas Hamastan, a Hamas theocracy. Instead of investing uh, the millions of dollars, billions of dollars that they get from the European Union, from the United States, from Japan, in infrastructure building, uh, in roads, hospitals, factories, and make Gaza the Singapore of the Middle East, as many people have suggested, they are spending the money on rockets, on terrorism, on equipments, on attack tunnels that dig under the Israeli border. And this is like, a, this is like a, a theocratic dictatorship. People really suffer in Gaza, but, but because of Hamas. Now, so this experiment failed. Palestinians were given an opportunity to show that they can live in peace, and they failed the test. Now, about the West Bank. So, there, there are realities in the West Bank. Uh, I myself thought that there should not be settlements in the West Bank, but we are 50 years after the Six-Day War, and there are realities. So, I think that what Trump will be doing is this. Uh, there is a document written by President George W. Bush in August 2004, and this document says we need to recognize the facts on the ground, and that uh, the uh, neighborhoods around Jerusalem and the big, big Jewish blocks in two, in two places will remain in Israeli hands even within the context of a peace agreement. And, um, and if you, about only about 4 or 5% of the territory includes about 90% of, of the Jews living there. So the Palestinians will get compensation for those 3 4% uh, in another place in Israel. And even the Palestinians agree that this would be a solution. Now the, the Bush uh, letter says then that, new con that construction would be allowed in those places, around Jerusalem and the big blocks. And I think this is, what, this is going to be the compromise that Trump will offer Israel. I think that withdrawal from the West Bank in return for peace, this is something that has been demanded all the time, but in order to facilitate that, the other side has to show serious willingness to sign a peace agreement. This has not been the case until now. And so the main obstacle is not the settlements, the main obstacle is the basic Palestinian attitude I have my own philosophical approach to that, but I don't think that this is the time to, to develop it. Why this happens, uh, why this Palestinian rejectionism, and uh, another expectation from Trump is perhaps to, to change that. And, um, and if, if this agreement is, if this, um, if this understanding between uh, Bush and, and Prime Minister Sharon is, will be adopted, then I think uh, it could serve as a good basis for a, re a renewed round of negotiations. But would you agree that ex ex acceptation of the Jerusalem and big settlement blocks is in reality a common sense? To do what? That the acceptance yes. of building in the big settlement blocks and around in Jerusalem is in reality, a common sense, this was like asked, oh, uh, okay. because this, 
I, for me, this is the common sense. If there should be some kind of agreement, and I don't believe in like kind of broad peace agreement, uh, but any agreement, any settlement, any move forward, this is the essence of what can be achieved and what is taking as common sense the reality on the ground into uh, into the whole picture. Uh, and it seems to me that yes, in this way, the Trump administration was trying to push Netanyahu. Unfortunately, Netanyahu promised another settlement to be built, a new one. So he has. He is facing domestic political crisis and crumbling of his government if he would go for this understanding. No, he now says that this is not a new settlement. It replaces one that was vacated. So there's, there's, a, there's a little difference here. But, uh, but in any event, yes, I think this, is, this will have to be recognized. And also I think that there's another problem here. Palestinians are arguing all the time that they are losing land. First of all, in the last few years, uh, there was not much loss of that land. This is, a, this is a, a secret, kept well secret. It was very little, if at all. But then the second thing is, it's, you know, you were talking about common sense. Well, it's very difficult to find common sense in the entire Middle East. But logically, think about it, logically, if you claim that you lose land all the time, what is the conclusion? Hurry up! Hurry up! Establish a state. Why are you waiting? Why are you uh, post postulating? So, for me, it means that the other side is not serious about negotiation, about making peace. This is the problem. Charles, and then Ambassador Kumerman. Thank you, Tomas. I'd like to thank Ambassador Poyar and Severo, and of course, Yagello for making it possible for you to come here, Professor. And thank you for taking the time to come to the Czech Republic. Two pieces of technology in the Russian armaments list could dramatically change the strategic picture in the Middle East. Currently under discussion is the provision by the Russian government of S-400 missiles to Turkey. If those were deployed in southeastern Turkey, which is not beyond imagination, the range of those missiles could dramatically impact many aspects of the situation in the East. Furthermore, if the Russians decided that that was not possible and deployed those missiles to Syria, this would have dramatic long-term implications. The second piece of technology, which is already deployed in the Donbass, in the Russian arsenal, is mobile satellite killer vehicles designed to blind geostationary satellites, which of course provide photographic evidence for analysis. If those vehicles were deployed, for example, to Syria on any of the Russian bases, this would have a dramatic impact, ultimately, on the decision-making process as well. In your opinion, please, Professor, what are the options open to the Trump administration for trying to forestall Erdogan from making that decision with the Russians for S-400s, and in the longer view, trying to forestall the Russians from being tempted to deploy these satellite killer vehicles in Syria. Thank you. First of all, I think that if Russia were to, if Russia, if Turkey were to buy those missiles from Russia, this uh, must have an adverse effect of, of NATO. Turkey is a member of NATO. How a NATO member buys sophisticated weapons from Russia? So I think this would make uh, both NATO, and I think Trump would be quite mad about it. This is something that he would, not, he would not accept. This is number one. Number two, there are already sophisticated Russian air defense missiles in Syria, SA-400, and they have a sophisticated radar system, they can, they see now, anytime an Israeli airplane takes off, they see it. And they can use those missiles to shoot down any such airplane all over Israel, any, anywhere in Israel. So this exists already and makes it very difficult for Israel to operate in, in Lebanon on other, on other matters. And um, about the, uh, the satellite killers, this, I think, is going to, to change um, uh, tremendously and dramatically the whole picture of, uh, of uh, satellite 
directed warfare, uh, it could completely compromise defense systems because this uh, rely heavily on, on satellite. But you know, here I'm less concerned, and I tell you why. Why, why not? Fortunately, Israel is uh, a startup nation and excels in technology, especially military technology, and has now uh, the most sophisticated uh, three-tier uh, anti-missile defense system. It's, uh, it's short-range, medium-range, and aero system in the air. This is developed with the United States. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people have been thinking about it, and I'm I'm quite confident, I don't know, I don't have uh, information myself, but I assume that this threat has been taken into consideration. And if there is a technological uh, anti uh, this satellite killer uh, weapon, somebody is working on it. So I'm a little bit less concerned about that, and you can always bomb it if, if it disturbs you. Thank you. Uh, would, you, would you think that Trump's administration would or could buy into uh, the old Lieberman idea of selling the triangle or making the triangle part of the, of the area switch? The question is about uh, swaps of the people, uh, the territory and the people, so the Umel Fahm triangle and, uh, and uh, this, uh, also another Lieberman's common sense idea which should not be ruled out. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, this is very funny because uh, there's a huge gap between what uh, the common Arab Israeli citizen of Israel says and what members of the, of the parliament who represent them say. Because they keep complaining about uh, discrimination and oppression of Israeli Arabs inside Israel. And they even say Israel is not a democratic country and they participate in all kinds of demonization efforts against Israel. Well, this is another thing that I forgot to mention. Israel expects the United States government to much more aggressively deal with those BDS ideas through legislation and, and other means. Uh, so, so I think that um, I, I, was, I was on television program and there was an Israeli Arab there uh, complaining, complaining, complaining and I said, I asked her the same question. What if we just change the border? And, and give, be, make you citizens of a Palestinian state. No! No, we, I don't want to do that. This is transfer. Well, this is not transfer. If I change the border and not change, uh, don't, don't kick you out somewhere, this is not a transfer. And, uh, and so she resisted that. Then there was a, a public opinion poll taken in, in, in the city that you mentioned, big, big Israeli Arab city, Um al Fahim. 95% said, we don't want to live in a Palestinian state. So how come if you are so oppressed and discriminated against, you have a chance to have your own country? You don't want to be a citizen of that, of that country? So you know, there's a lot of hypocrisy here and, and a lot of rhetoric that has nothing to do with reality. And since you were ambassador to Israel, you may, you may know that better than anybody else. Uh, in order to achieve that, however, you need, you, need, you, need, you need an agreement. And I don't know even if the Palestinian Authority would like that to happen because uh, Israeli Arabs are quite educated and quite sophisticated and they will ask, they will demand, like, democratizing the, the Palestinian government, something that has never happened. And uh, this is, again, the Palestinian Authority, unfortunately, is corrupt gets a lot of money from the, from the EU, for example. Nobody knows what they do with the money. Maybe some bankers in Switzerland would know because many of them became very rich. The money does not go into productive areas. 
So, so you, you argue, okay, if you, want to, if you want an agreement to change territory, maybe we also have to exchange populations. So Jews will remain in certain areas in the West Bank. Arab, Israeli Arabs will become citizens of a Palestinian state. I think, again, I think it, it makes sense. But you need, you need a lot of effort. Uh, to achieve that, and I think Israeli Arabs don't want to, that, Israeli Arabs prefer to live in Israel than in any Palestinian state, which tells you something about, about the present nature of that, of that Palestinian state. Many say, okay, they are Israeli citizens, you cannot really do that. But I checked international law. International law says a country can redraw the border. Then People can do whatever they want. But it's complicated. Some people think that if this is were to happen, all those Israeli Arabs would leave Umar Faham and move to Jaffa or to, or to, or to, or to other place. They would, not, they would not want to do that. So, we have a time for one more question. There is... So, we will take two more questions there. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Karel Novak. I'm interested in your opinion regarding the Kurdish question. Uh, you spoke shortly about it. Can you see any chance for Kurdish nation to establish their own, um, I don't know if possible to say the state, but administration units or something like this in the Middle East, for example, I don't know, in the north of Syria or something like something that. Repeat it. Repeat it. The, Kurd, the question about the Kurd. The question is about the, what is the future of the Kurds? Kurdish state, Kurdish autonomous region in northern Syria, they have uh, in northern Iraq. Uh, what is the future of the Kurds? I've been asked this question many times. And the Kurds, unfortunately for them, are dispersed. They live in northern Iraq, in Iran, in, uh, in eastern Turkey and northern Syria, all over the place. There are about 30 million Kurds. They deserve a state much more than the Palestinians. They don't get any attention. They had the best opportunity maybe in their history to establish a state. The problem is that because they live in different countries, and this is how it happens in the Middle East. Uh, you have one people, you have half a dozen organizations fighting each other. This is true for the Palestinians, it's true for the Kurds, it's true for, true for other groups in the region. So, this opportunity did not materialize simply because uh, they, are, they are fighting each other. So the Kurds of Syria fight the Kurds of Iraq, and both uh, not, uh, don't, don't like the Kurds of Turkey. And so, it is, is, a, is a challenge for them. However, there is a de facto Kurdish state in northern Iraq. And this is uh, Erdogan nightmare. And he suddenly became interested in participating in the fighting against Mosul, not because he is concerned about ISIS, He's concerned about the Kurds and he wants to make sure that if his troops are inside the area, he could prevent the next step, which is like complete independence. But I've already said that it seems to me it's going to be extremely difficult to preserve the territorial integrity of both Iraq and Syria. And I think that, I remember that the Kurds of Syria were the best fighters against ISIS. ISIS. And they were equipped by, by America. But suddenly, uh, when they moved forward, Turkey threatened to fight them. Obama told them, stop. I don't want you to move any further. The Kurds felt betrayed by this Obama uh, order. There's, there's a chance, though, for the Kurds at least to establish a political unit close to a state in northern Iraq. They control everything there already. They have a very good army. 
Beyond that, I think it's going to be very difficult given what I've just said about leadership fighting. Okay, and the last question there. How do you see the present Egyptian uh, regime and its role in uh, peace process? And how you can evaluate, how you evaluate its a a strategic decisions towards this, uh, the Syrian issue, for example? How do you see the Egyptian regime and also the Egyptian regime linked to Syria and linked to the peace process? Sisi's regime. Yeah. So what happened in Egypt is an excellent case study in misunderstanding of what is happening in the Middle East. I'm saying that because Americans and Western Europeans frequently equate democracy with elections. You have elections, you have democracy. This is not true. Because if undemocratic authoritarian movements such as the Islamic, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or Hamas in Gaza, they abuse the democratic process to eliminate democracy because they want to establish a theocracy. So, the American conception under Obama was that there is a chance to reconcile Islam with democracy. And for several years, they described Erwan in Turkey as the creator of demo Islam. Turns out that he himself proved that there's no such thing. But they also considered the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt as moderate movement you can work with. Obama made the distinction between radical Islam like ISIS and Al-Qaeda with whom you cannot negotiate. You have to fight them. And then he said, uh, the one Muslim Brotherhood, maybe Hamas, we can engage them. They are good Islamists. And so, for me, uh, I made a commentary on, on television when, Mubar when um, Obama went to Egypt on June 9th, 2009. This was his second visit. The first visit was to Ankara. Second visit was to, and he praised Erdogan for his demo Islam. And then he went to Cairo. This was in June 2009. And he made a speech at uh, Al Haram University. And Mubarak was not there. And I asked myself, well, why, Obama, why Mubarak is not there? Turns out that Obama said, I want the Muslim Brotherhood to be represented there. So Mubarak said, you know, they are trying to remove me from power. They are radical Islamists. I'm not going to sit there. And he didn't come. So Obama thought Morsi won the elections and he would move Egypt from a military regime to demo Islam. What happened is that Morsi had other ideas. He wanted to move Egypt from a military rule to Islamic rule and establish a Islamic theocracy because this is the ideology and agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood. Very simple. So I heard in Washington this argument when radical Islamists become leaders of a country they become moderate. Oh, we invented that. It, it, is, it is not working in the Middle East. The Iranians took over, the Islamic, uh, <coughs> Islamic Revolution took over Iran. Had they become more moderate? Hezbollah is ruling uh, Lebanon. Have, have they become more moderate? Islamists in Algeria, have they become more, more, more moderate? Taliban in Afghanistan, have they become more moderate? So who invented this nonsense? But this is, this is, this is guided, this approach. So... So Morsi was a legitimate leader elected by the people. For the military, for Sisi, which Morsi appointed incidentally as, 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 a, as a chief of staff. So uh, for when Sisi organized a counter-revolution against a democratic 
democratically elected leader, this infuriated Obama. He could not accept that. Now, this was the only time in recent time that an Islamic government was more removed from power and replaced. So, uh, I ex Trump is less concerned about that. He's more concerned about repairing relations with Egypt. And I think that there's a good chance that this will happen. Because of that, Obama personal uh, negative attitude towards military coup d'etat. Uh, but there's a problem in Egypt. There's a, a demographic problem. Every economic gain is eaten by demography. The people, the, the, too many people, too many more people are born and they kill the economic growth. So there's a lot of concern also in Israel about the future of Egypt because of the almost inevitable inability to improve significantly the economic situation on the ground. And this is where the United States and, and Europe and other affluent countries, if they want uh, to prevent Egypt from becoming an Islamic country, to contribute much more to the economic development of the country. And if they do so, I think that uh, the road to democracy would be easier because for the poor people, why Morsi was, was successful? And why other leaders in the Middle East, religious leaders are successful? Because they tell the people, Islam is the solution. You become more religious, then everything is going to be fine. This did not happen in countries controlled by uh, Islamic governments. Didn't happen in Gaza, didn't happen in Afghanistan, didn't, didn't happen in Iran. But I think that the way to deal with it is to show that secular modern governments can do better. And external aid is crucial in that, in that area. What about Sisi and Syria? Is Sisi supporting Assad to stay as a regime because it is for the protection of the regime, as, uh, of yes. the military regime, and which is some kind of a change in the uh, attitude of Egypt uh, towards Syria from the two years ago and now of the same Sisi and the same government? This is, this is exactly the situation. I think that um, um, Sisi changed his mind. At the beginning he opposed uh, the retaining of Bashar al-Assad, but now he is changing his mind. I think he's a realist. He feels that uh, Assad is winning. And it's better to have uh, good relations w with him and Russia. He's even trying to repair relations with Russia. He was so disappointed by Obama that he was seeking some new connections with Putin. So, yes, I think that he changed his mind because of what is happening in Syria. And because maybe he also concluded that, uh, you know, Bashar al-Assad is a terrible leader, terrible dictator, but those who may succeed him could be worse. And this is a dilemma that you have all the time in the Middle East. Thank you very much. I do thank you. I do thank Yagelo uh, 2000, of course, uh, the Israeli Public Diplomacy uh, Forum. I do thank the Czech-Israeli Chamber of Commerce, uh, and there are some members here in the room for support of this event. Uh, as uh, it is not your first visit to Prague, you've been here many times, uh, it is hopefully not your last visit in Prague, and thank you for this performance and all the other lectures and speeches you have uh, done here and discussions in the last two days, and uh, we hope to see you here uh, soon and quite often. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for coming and thanks again for the organizers and I hope that you will continue to be interested in the region uh, because it is crucial not only for the people of the region but also for the people in Europe. Thank you again.